Good morning. My name is Mark Baldessari, and I am president and CEO of the Public Policy Institute of California. Thank you for joining us today. PPIC is pleased to present this program featuring the Chief Justice of California, Tony Cantil Sakaue. This event is part of PPIC's 2021 speaker series on California's future. As a public charity, PPIC does not take or support positions on any ballot measure or legislation, nor does it support, endorse, or oppose any political parties or candidates for public office. We would like to thank the sponsors of this series for their underwriting support. These organizations are listed on your screen and on our website. The series is also funded by the PPIC Donor Circle and the PPIC Corporate Circle, individuals and organizations that provide generous support to PPIC. Please consider joining us as a sponsor or donor so that we may continue to make programs like today's possible. More information is available at ppic.org. Before we begin, if you have a question for the Chief Justice, please send an email with your name and organization to PPIC events PPIC event questions at gmail.com. We will have time for your questions later in the program. And now I would like to welcome our featured speaker, Chief Justice. Thank you so much for joining us today and for your public service during these extraordinary times. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be with you and PPIC once again. So I thought we would start by um, asking some questions of you about uh, the pandemic and how that uh, has impacted the courts. So from your vantage point, what are one or two important lessons learned over the past year and a half as courts have adapted to the new realities brought on by the pan pandemic? Thank you, Mark, for that thoughtful question. Um, the courts have had to adapt. Embedded in your question is exactly the position that I and my colleagues statewide have taken, that the courts must remain open, that justice cannot close. And therefore, whatever the circumstances, we must persevere. The judges, the lawyers, our professional staffs, there is just no question about the fact that we will be open in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And open across California might have a different nuance during a pandemic that involved several orders, state orders, lockdowns, county orders, county orders that must be harmonized with state orders and the need for justice that spikes in certain caseloads, particularly mm -hmm. during crisis. Mm -hmm. So the first lesson is, there, we must not, we're not shutting down. The question is, how do we proceed? And one of those lessons we learned is that we will, through our resiliency, we will innovate and we will try new things and we will seek new authority. Mm -hmm. And therefore, as a result, as you know, we, we published 13 emergency orders. The governor gave the Judicial Council and myself as chair unprecedented authority through an executive order mm -hmm. to suspend statutes. We took emergency action Every court in every county applied for a, an emergency order that I'm authorized by statute to permit the court to operate under threat of disruption. Mm -hmm. um, so we did. We were busier because on top of the work we did uh, normally, we had also now to adapt our structures and bring together our stakeholders to mm -hmm. understand and be, be responsive uh, to what they needed. Um, I think that's certainly the first lesson is we're not stopping. We can't stop. We're not closing. And the second uh, that I've learned and I've always known, but particularly in times of crisis to every single Californian and internationally is any solution forward is a three branch solution. It is an executive, legislative and judicial solution that statutes cannot be passed unless the judicial branch is actively involved in the execution and planning of the benefits of the cascading uh, consequences of any good intentioned, well-intentioned statute passed by the legislature signed by the governor. Hmm. Well, thank you. Um, so for um, many of the people on uh, who are listening uh, in today, they, they may not um, have as a uh, full uh, uh, version of what the role of the Chief Justice is uh, for the courts as, as, as I have um, in speaking with you on a number of occasions in the past. 
So, um, and when you talk about court, you talk about courts um, throughout the state, not just the um, Supreme Court. So um, if we could step back for a moment, maybe I give everybody a bit of, of, of what uh, civics education and uh, give us a sense of what your job is like as um, the Chief Justice. Thank you. Uh, Mark, that's uh, one of my favorite questions because for many, the judiciary is shrouded in, in I, uh, dark rooms and mysticism for some reason. But I'll start very basically by saying, as you know, the judicial branch is the third co-equal branch of government. Mm -hmm. And in California, probably like all things Californian, we are the largest judiciary, law trained and diverse in the United States. Mm -hmm. And probably in the world, because there are other states uh, that don't require their judges to be lawyers for 10 years before their judges, or they don't even require their judges uh, to be lawyers, period, or law trained. So California's judiciary is massive. Uh, and it's massive because we have 40 million residents and we have at least 6 million filings a year in our courts. And we have over 2000 judicial officers and our staffs. And we're, we are, as I've said to you before, we are like a three-story house, the superior courts on the first level, the courts of record. Everyone goes to a superior court, whether it's for traffic, complex civil, a dissolution. And then if uh, they believe there's been error at the superior court, and remind you, there's always a loser, so someone always thinks there's error, you can go to the second floor of the uh, judicial branch, which is the court of appeal where uh, three justices sit on a panel to decide a case. And if you feel at that level that you still feel wronged, you have the right to ask or petition the California Supreme Court where the third floor of the judicial branch. So it mm -hmm. goes from one judge at the Superior Court, three justices at the appellate level, and then the Supreme Court, there are seven of us. And we decide all matters in California that arise from the California state constitution and every single law and initiative that is either passed by the legislature or the people. And the California Supreme Court is a reflection, really. Our cases are a reflection of the turmoil and the issues that are in society and the ills of society at the time. And I, as chief, not only am a member of the California Supreme Court. I carry the same caseload. I'm also the Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court. I wear the hat of the administer, administrator. Mm -hmm. I watch budget, I hold meetings, I assign cases, I run the court with a great deal of help from my very talented staff of lawyers and professionals. And also I wear the hat of the Judicial Council. The Judicial Council is the policy making body of the judiciary. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have the Judicial Council, we'd just be a collection of courts and various voices. Mm -hmm. But the constitution has created, in the constitution there is a Judicial Council. Mm -hmm. It names the Chief Justice as the chair. It's like a board of directors for mm -hmm. the California judiciary. Mm -hmm. We are a diverse group of lawyers, judges, professional staff. And we allocate the $4 billion budget of the judiciary to all three levels of court. And we are responsible for jury instruction, civil and criminal, and every type of policy that affects the judicial branch, including the administration of justice overall in all three branches. Hmm. Uh, that's the second hat I wear. That's as, that's as active a hat as being on the Supreme Court as a member and as chief. And then the third hat I wear is as a representative of the judiciary. I speak mm -hmm. for the judiciary. Um, I am uh, the person who negotiates and is in session with the governor and the two leaders of the legislature, uh, President Pro Tem Atkins and uh, Assembly Speaker Rendon. Wow, we're speaking to the right person today and thank you for, for your time. Uh, that's uh, quite quite a, a, a large basket of responsibilities. Uh, let's start with what it was like to be um, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and meeting uh, with uh, the, the members of the Supreme Court during the pandemic and uh, maybe reflect on some of the more challenging moments for, uh, for, for, for this important branch of government to be making decisions. Thank you. Well, at the California Supreme Court, there are 
seven of us. Mm -hmm. And as chief, uh, I have no greater vote than any of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. And so I believe the California Supreme Court is blessed with brilliant, collegial, thoughtful people. And so uh, there's Justice Corrigan, who is the senior justice now. Mm -hmm. And there is uh, Justice Goodwin Liu, and Justice Mariano Florentino Cuellar, who will be leaving soon, creating a vacancy for Governor Newsom to appoint. Mm -hmm. And uh, then next we have Justice Leandra Kruger, uh, Justice uh, uh, Josh Groban, and then Justice Marty Jenkins. Mm -hmm. Justice Marty Jenkins is Governor Gavin Newsom's first appointment to the California Supreme Court. He was appointed in January mm -hmm. uh, 2020. And he has lived his entire life as a Supreme Court justice almost completely in the pandemic. Oh. But because the rest of us had had such good history with one another, mm -hmm. and because we meet regularly and we know each other and we have a level of comfort, it was very easy for us to become mm -hmm. a remote court mm -hmm. where we still speak quite a bit together on phone calls and we communicate on emails and texts mm -hmm. and we share our written responses and, mm -hmm. and our views and analyses uh, by email. And we also talk to each other as a group once a, once a week. I, I put out the call, we catch up on each other's lives. Mm -hmm. And then we discuss the most uh, trying issues in California. Mm -hmm. And the reason they're at the Supreme Court is because there is no one firm answer and we're going to clarify that. Yeah. And we get the input of seven different points of view appointed by uh, different governors, different mm -hmm. life experiences, different ages, different stages of life, mm -hmm. uh, different locations. And the beauty is we have trust with each other and mm -hmm. we're able to explain something and then hear perhaps a contrary understanding of the issue. And we write for clarity. We write and author our opinions with the input of mm -hmm. all seven members. I always say California uh, Supreme Court opinions are authored by a chamber, but it reflects the thoughts and values and handprints and fingers and DNA of every single justice to get agreement. And we're largely uh, unanimous mm -hmm. in our uh, decisions because we speak, I think, primarily to clarify the law so that the mm -hmm. judges and the lawyers and the clients of the lawyers mm -hmm. and the pro pers understand that they can live their life without fear of litigation. Mm -hmm. And so we went and turned to remote oral argument. Mm -hmm. The hardest part of remote oral argument was the attorneys who were appearing before mm -hmm. us. They just <laughs> felt a little uncomfortable about that. Uh. Every single one was a good sport. Mm -hmm. Every single one joined mostly super majority jo joined by remote mm. oral argument. Mm -hmm. And remember an attorney before the California Supreme Court may only get in his or her lifetime one argument before the California Supreme Court. Yeah. So they typically want to appear in person, yeah. uh, but we'd, we've been remote since uh, Governor Newsom's lockdown order in March, 2020. And but we've all been there. We've all been lawyers. We've all been before a court. So right before they appear before us remotely, our clerk of the court, Jorge Navarrete, walks through a Zoom, a, a, Zoom, a platform remote presentation with every single litigant oh, who gosh. is appearing, answers all the questions. We yeah. even offer, if they want, they can come to court, get set up on a court remote computer hmm. and have their argument in some other room in the court so that they can wow. be assured of their bandwidth, they can be assured yeah. of their equipment. And while they all want to come back to in person, we've done a survey, yeah. um, they're, they were happy with how remote turned out. That's really interesting that they all want to come back, um, especially when you talk about the reluctance at the beginning. So I, I want to turn back to the pandemic for a moment, but uh, in case we don't get to this later, I just I've been wanting to ask you this. I mean, most of us, um, when we hear about Supreme Court, we think about um, SCOTUS and we think about six to three, fifth to five to four votes, things like that. Um, so how have you managed to uh, create the kind of team chemistry that you that you actually been able to do um, with uh, the Supreme Court of California at a time when, um, you know, uh, we have such political divisions um, in, in our country about um, about so many different matters. And, and this is, um, I mean, even more remarkable when I think about the fact that 
you don't get to pick your team, right? I mean, it's the governor who's making the nominations and, and then they're being confirmed and so forth. So what's your, what's your approach to creating that kind of um, uh, 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 environment, um, especially when we hear about environment that's very different when we hear the term Supreme Court? That's, a, that's an interesting observation. Thank you, Mark. Well, I would say for our viewers that you realize that of all the litigation in the United States, 90% of the litigation happens at the state mm. court levels, mm. uh, not at, the, at SCOTUS's level. So we are generally enmeshed in much litigation over many, a variety of issues. Mm -hmm. And I think first and foremost, uh, I can't take credit for how collegial we are as a team. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for every single justice I've worked with. And I've, I've sat up through five different benches now. I've been on the bench 11 years at the Supreme Court level, and I've seen five justices come and go. Mm -hmm. We've always been collegial. We've always had, at least in the last mm -hmm. 11 years, a record of unanimity and collegiality. But I think really, Mark, it comes down to the fact that the vetting process for mm. state Supreme Court justices is uh, rigorous. Mm. And uh, when we come together, we are we respect each other yeah. and we we are fond of each other. And I know I always say when I might be in the minority of the op opinion, I say, mm. well, since so many smart people that I like hold a different opinion. Let me rethink this. Let me go mm -hmm. back and rethink this. Mm -hmm. And we talk about what we can agree on and where we disagree. We ask ourselves, how relevant, important is this to the outcome of the facts of this case and the rule we want to make? Uh, because we might wait for the case that will divide us when we know we have division, but can we come, can we coalesce on the fact of this case without getting so broad that we're in places where we can't come together and we can't write a meaningful opinion that clarifies the issue before us. Yeah. And then of course, with the ability to write separately, then we can speak out to invite that case that we're waiting for or to uh, muse about a future situation that isn't before us. Yeah. So we have outlets and we have a process where we, try to ensure that we give ourselves enough time to work out our differences. Thank you. And I, and I just felt it was important for people to hear that as we think about um, our democracy today and our branches of government to, to understand. And I think also to recognize that we have a court in which uh, several different governors have uh, at this point made, um, made the appointments. Um, Schwarzenegger, uh, Brown, and now Newsom, and uh, mm -hmm. maybe there are some that uh, from previous times. So, but it sounds like you all come into it with a sense of a mutual mutual respect and a sense that you've made it to this point in the process for a reason. Um, I'd like to turn to the other big part of, of your work, which, um, and I don't know how to assess what percentage of your time you spend on each thing, but if I think about the superior courts, and, and if I think about the diversity in the counties in California, the numbers, and then the diversity of county institutions in the state. I mean, give us a sense of what the pandemic has been like uh, as you've gone around and talked to um, people in the superior courts around the state. There are 58 superior courts in California because we have 58 counties and each superior court is different and diverse geographically, uh, urban metropolises, rural areas, diversity. We can go to um, Alpine County and you find two judges. You can go to Siskiyou County and there'll be five judges. You can go to Los Angeles County and there'll be over 600 judges. Nice. Um, you can, Los Angeles County, I'm not telling anyone anything new, has 10 million people. Alpine has 1,200. But the courts in each of these 58 counties must operate under the same law providing equal justice so that a person in Del Norte County gets the same level of justice and attention and care as they would if they were in San Diego County. Mm. Um, and because the counties are so diverse and every county court, every court in every county 
also tries to follow the rules of the local county. And those are all run by different boards of supervisors and different organizations. They have different health orders across the 58 counties. Then we have the governor's order. Then we have the state uh, public health order. And so you see that every county is being responsive to its environment. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we've had different ways of approaching how we provide justice in each county. So in the beginning, some counties did not need to go remote and they did not need at that point any emergency orders to operate because they were basically unaffected. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the metropolis, uh, the more metropolitan areas like San Francisco, uh, Santa Clara, uh, all across the Bay Area and Southern California, everyone needed an emergency order to mm. slow the caseload so that we didn't become a super spreader in the mm -hmm. courts. So we yeah. didn't have massive groups of people. Then we had to talk about the jail population mm -hmm. and the prison populations that, that regularly, readily come into the courthouses for their cases that are transported by guards that interact with our court family. Wow. And so we had to shrink our footprint and slow our roll, but try to get to everyone using in-person and remote. And every county differed, but every county struggled. Hmm. And every county worked with its stakeholders, the Los Angeles Public Defenders, the Los Angeles County District Attorneys Association, the plaintiff's lawyers, the defense lawyers. They all worked with their courts. They have relationships with their presiding judge. And was it always perfect? Were people always happy? And was it uh, kumbaya? No. Hmm. And so I found myself in the middle with judicial council meeting with the associations and the stakeholders, asking them legal aid, what do you need? Mm. Where are we falling down? What mm. counties need more support from mm. the judicial council? Uh, if we had a perfect world, what should we improve first? What should we improve next? How do we prioritize? So there was a lot of meetings, a lot of rules, a lot of trying to keep everyone calm and knowing that we're going to get to this uh, in order, and no one is going to be forgotten. And um, as you go around the state today, um, more than a year and a half um, from when the pandemic started, what are you what are you seeing when you go to the various um, counties in terms of how the courts are working? I see the courts are all still working, and they are all in some form of a hybrid process, mm -hmm. in person and remote. I'm seeing uh, probably more the effects of the city on the court. So businesses are closed. There's few people on the street. Mm. Um, the uh, courts have uh, some of their own staff who've become ill in, pop in these populations. So they're short staffed. They're making amends. They're, they're, they're asking for emergency orders to use just in case. They don't need them as much anymore, right. but a few courts have had them just in case because there may be a county that doesn't have a very high vaccination rate um, or they're a county that has a prison as primarily its population and mm -hmm. the vaccination and the uh, pandemic virus is rising and falling in the prisons and the jails mm -hmm. and that's going to affect. I'll tell you, Mark, in the last year and a half, I have signed over 600 different emergency orders for the 58 courts to have, uh -huh. to use if needed, if it mm -hmm. comes to where they cannot process, mostly criminal and juvenile cases within mm -hmm. the statutory timeframes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so I recall when we last um, talked together, which was in December, 2019, a few months before the, um, before the coronavirus outbreak, um, you uh, mentioned something that made an impression on me. You said that equal access to justice is especially important in times of crisis. <laughs> uh, and I, I think it suffices to say in our lifetimes, you know, we, we never have a, had a crisis that has been like this one. Um, and so could you give me a sense about um, how those operating principles that you've, you've carried um, through your work as a Supreme Court Justice of Equity and Access have influenced your, um, your approach to um, uh, the courts during the pandemic. Thank you, Mark. Before the pandemic, I, I want the, the working public to know the, the courts were not and have never been fully funded. Hmm. We took a 
uh, a, a huge loss during the Great Recession. And mm. we spent the years thereafter just trying to get our heads above water. Mm -hmm. uh, during the Great Recession, the judicial branch was not funded well. It wasn't funded fully. It wasn't stably funded. Mm -hmm. We went through so many cuts and layoffs and furloughs and closing mm -hmm. courts and closing courtrooms and reducing hours. And then as the state started to recover, we started to recover. But we had we we were we were starting from a place of deficit. Mm -hmm. but we had been wise stewards of our money and we had taken money and invested in technology and pilot projects. Mm. And so in my mind, access to justice, and as the pandemic has shown, has really shown us that while in-person appearance is the gold standard for access to justice, mm -hmm. it's not everyone's choice. Mm -hmm. People want to have their day in court, but they want to have their day in court in a different way. They want remote access, which has been one of the pillars of my access three-dimensional, that is that access to justice be physical, come in if you want. Mm -hmm. Remote, come online and talk to us from your kitchen because we're okay with that. <laughs> or that, and that it always be equal. But during mm -hmm. the pandemic, we learned that access to justice through remote technology or even through a phone call, increased access, mm -hmm. particularly in family law, and juvenile delinquency, juvenile dependency, we found that we reached people like children are more comfortable talking to a person in a black robe from the kitchen table. Uh -huh. uh, families and parents who lived out of state could join in. Uh, we could have access for people who didn't have to take the bus to downtown mm -hmm. San Francisco and miss a day of work. Mm -hmm. We found that uh, domestic violence orders could be heard remotely and the complaining witness or the victim wasn't afraid to be in the same mm. room anymore because now they only saw the other person on the screen. Mm. We found a new equity, a new fairness in access to justice through a remote process. And we'll never give that up. Uh, we have authority under the legislature to provide a remote access for civil cases as an opt-in for one year. Uh, and we hope that we can build from that because we have seen choice matters mm -hmm. and remote access works. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, largely what we hear about are sort of the anecdotal, um, uh, you know, anecdotal information, but can you give, give uh, so uh, on the issue of whether the courts experiencing more of a backlog now or less of a backlog or you know, how, how would you describe just the, the, yeah, the flow of work now, um, a year and a half after the pandemic started? We have kept incredible data on mm -hmm. this exact issue. Mm -hmm. And naturally, in uh, early 2020 and throughout the first few months of the lockdown and the pandemic, we saw caseloads, uh, we, we, we saw dispositions slow down. And when dispositions slow down, you imagine there's a backlog. But keep in mind that during the early parts of the pandemic in 2020, particularly 2020, businesses closed, yeah. uh, traffic slowed. There were fewer filings uh, of at least a criminal nature in uh, the state of California mm. because everything just flattened. Mm. And so we... We knew our dispositions were slowing because mm -hmm. we had, as I said earlier, shrunk our court footprint and slowed the cases. But remote access allowed us to reach back to almost the same pre-pandemic disposition. Mm -hmm. And we found that I said earlier in juvenile family and uh, juvenile delinquency, dependency and family, we were now ahead of ourselves. We had caught up with our pre-pandemic uh, backlog because mm -hmm. people were willing to now handle something remotely. Mm -hmm. And so now what our data shows in uh, 2021, the effects of 2020 is some metropolitan large city uh, courts have backlogs mm -hmm. that are solely related to the fact that we couldn't get to their civil case in time. And so there is a backlog but it's not quite as large as we thought it would be. Hmm. And we're lucky and fortunate to have the legislature and the governor provide the judicial branch with one-time funding to address COVID backlog. Hmm. And we have taken our data 
we've distributed half of the money and we mm -hmm. said, show us what you can do with half. Huh. And then we're waiting for that data to come in to distribute the other half of this one time COVID backlog money because we are data driven and we want to ensure that we're using this money wisely. Mm -hmm. um, and we hope to truly get back at the very minimum to pre pandemic levels. Thank you. Uh, so you've um, talked a lot about the, um, the, pro the, the advantages of re remote proceedings um, today, um, but um, in things that I've read that you've said, you've also talked about the issue of the digital divide and how it, that impacts access to California's courts. And so, um, you know, as you think about um, equity and access, um, what do you think uh, can be done about the fact that not everyone has access today to those tools that make it possible for them to, um, to, to be part of remote proceedings? This is a, an issue I referred to earlier as a three branch solution. Mm -hmm. The judiciary can only urge the other two branches of government to address the digital divide. And I know Governor Newsom has signed legislation to that effect. Uh, however, we at the courts can't wait for the other two branches. Mm -hmm. And so we have tried to address the digital divide by inviting people mm -hmm. who don't have the means, the bandwidth, the equipment at home to come to the courts. And we will provide that to you and we'll guide you through it. Mm -hmm. uh, you might, you'd still be appearing remotely in most instances, but we have someone on hand who uh, self-help centers, which we mm -hmm. grew during the pandemic, we mm -hmm. grew them to provide greater services and someone can help you and walk you through it and get you where you need to be. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you will have to come down to the court. We're trying to avoid that. We're trying to avoid that you get on public transit. We're mm -hmm. trying to avoid, I'll just take San Francisco as an example, that you don't have to get on BART or the Muni, which mm -hmm. I'm not even sure if it's fully running, to come into court to have your day. But this is the best we can do under the circumstances is we can give you the tools at court and we can walk you through and we can teach you through, we have tutorials in family law. We have bots that mm. walk you through. Uh, mm. The Los Angeles County has Gina, an, uh, what are you, an avatar who walks you through some of the most commonly uh, used kinds of cases mm. in the Los Angeles Superior Court. So we have ways to reach you, but they're not ideal mm -hmm. to get close to ideal, we'd need the other two branches of government to address this. Mm -hmm. And um, in the past, we've talked also about, about the importance of language access in the courts. And I, I, I wonder if we could take a moment to, um, to update on where we are um, as we move into using uh, remote pr proceedings with, uh, with our efforts to make language access more more readily available in the courts. Thank you. Well, for the viewers, California, uh, we, have we have determined that in California courts, over 200 different languages and dialects are mm -hmm. spoken every, every week. Mm -hmm. And we have, back in 2012, I initiated a language access commission to study what can we do? And they came back with recommendations. And I put Justice Tino Cuellar in charge of implementing the recommendations. And he was magnificent in this role, bringing together the interpreters, the stakeholders, the courts to uh, improve and increase language access in mm -hmm. California, not only through the spoken word, but the translated word, the written word, mm -hmm. signage, and also uh, with pilot video, remote interpreters. Um, I used to be a trial judge years ago. I'd call and say, I need an interpreter for a specific language. I would be told, well, you're gonna have to wait a week because mm -hmm. the only interpreter has to hit Reading first and then go to Yuba. So you're third in line. And I'd say, well, Mr. Lawyer, your client's gonna have to wait a week because, oh, will his daughter translate? See, that's not an, that is not an ideal situation in law. 
So we implemented recommendations and both Governor Brown and Governor Newsom and the legislatures have fully funded our requests for language access. I shouldn't say fully funded, but they have no, they know of the issue. They continue to give us resources that we may grow language access. And now we have language access in courts, criminal and civil free of charge. And we also have language access available at the counters where you need a service. Mm -hmm. We have our self-help, we have our website, we have all of our forms uh, translated into Spanish. Mm -hmm. So you can have a Spanish translation. And we're also working now as we speak on a pilot that I was told about that is uh, taking live language and in real time translating it for the person who calls in for self-help, mm. determining the language and then finding a, a simultaneous real-time translator to be able to translate the questions into English and the response from mm. English into the language of the needy. Wow, that's really impressive. Um, that's, that's, uh... That's, that's quite, uh, quite impressive. I wonder if we could, um, um, on the topic of uh, diversity in the courts, um, recognizing that the pandemic um, has surfaced all sorts of issues around racial disparities that we were aware of, but now we're very much aware of. And um, you have um, in the past, um, made it a priority to uh, make sure that we have judges that are more representative of California's diversity. I'd like to know if you're thinking about what more representative uh, means uh, has changed and what kind of progress we're making on that. Thank you. Uh, I, we think about diversity in the courts as part of our uh, DNA. It's part of it, it's diversity, it's technology and it's access. And that's the prism through which every idea, every concept is uh, seen through. And of course, taking judicial diversity, judicial diversity depends frankly on lawyer diversity because the, as you know, as everyone knows, you have to be a lawyer before you can become a judge. And so the judicial council, the policy making body of the judicial branch of California uh, and California being the most diverse judiciary, the most diverse Supreme Court, uh, the most diverse judicial council in its history, has uh, created a number of programs. We have a toolkit that we have, the diversity toolkit that we just recently updated a few months ago, that we distribute to courts for their use mm -hmm. in order that they can mentor not only uh, each other in terms of education and awareness, but also their staffs and also provide leadership opportunities for their staffs to grow in their positions. And that's through the Judicial Council. We also uh, sponsored as part of the uh, effort along with California Lawyers Association and along with the state, uh, the state bar and the California Judges Association. We just recently finished the Judicial Diversity Summit, mm -hmm. where we had judges come together because there's great interest amongst the judges to try to encourage people to apply to the governor for a judicial appointment. Mm -hmm. Additionally, our judges have worked with the governor and uh, his newest judicial appointment secretary, Luis Cespedes, to create a judicial mentoring program. Los mm -hmm. Angeles has taken the lead in that respect. Uh, they also with San Francisco and other Bay Area courts, and they're using our diversity toolkit to get lawyers thinking about this is what they should be pursuing in the future and to plan ahead and to ensure that they document their work so that they mm -hmm. can fill out the application. Also, though, we're working with lawyers. We're working with lawyers. We're working with uh, college students to think about the future of, of law, and not just as a lawyer, frankly, mm -hmm. as about any professional in the judiciary. We have our civics education program, my initiative, with through the power of democracy, where we speak through K through 12. Mm -hmm. And our role is to teach the power of democracy, three branches of government with an emphasis on the judiciary. So we reach out to these students and we encourage them. We, we put judges in the classroom to talk with the students across the state. It's improved with remote so that we can get judges to be someone you can relate to and you can mm -hmm. think about maybe one day identifying with and looking at that as a profession. Uh, we speak regularly with the governor's office about the need for a diverse judiciary. 
we, um, I know I, through judicial counsel, look primarily to diversity writ large. Mm. I look at geographic diversity. I look at economic diversity, experience diversity, uh, veterans diversity, uh, dis, uh, disabled status diversity, gender. Across the board, we mm. want as many voices as we can contributing to policy because then we think we have a better policy on the, out, on the outcome. And we all know the challenges of recruiting and retaining top talent, um, particularly um, uh, the last uh, couple of years. And how are we doing in terms of diversity of, of, of judges? We're doing very well. Uh, the numbers have all increased. Uh, Governor okay. Brown, I'll start with that, his eight years, he made unprecedented increases in appointments to the judiciary that were many were still in, if you can believe it, in, in 2019 were, and prior were firsts mm -hmm. to the bench mm -hmm. for in terms of representation. And he had Josh Groban, who is now a justice, who was his appointment secretary for judges and Josh and the governor, he appointed well over 700 judicial officers and the diversity was truly at that point uh, unprecedented. And Governor Newsom has continued in that same uh, vein of diverse appointments, many firsts, Luis Cespedes and prior to him, uh, uh, Marty Jenkins, who's now on our court, have made it a priority for their governor to seek writ large mm -hmm. diversity for the uh, judicial branch. And so I think uh, our numbers have all increased. Women are now 38% of the judiciary. There was a time when we didn't even break double digits. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the only ethnic group that has broken double digits representation in the judiciary at my last check, my last check was Hispanic or Latinx. Mm -hmm. I think that's 11% of the judiciary and growing. Mm -hmm. Everyone else that uh, we count, uh, Asians and all across, because you self-identify, are less than uh, 10%, 6%, mm -hmm. 8%. But keep in mind that every year we do a survey of who are you? Mm -hmm. uh, we're mandated by the legislature to turn in our statistics of who we are, what our preferences are. It's optional to fill out the form, but this is how we keep uh, data on the diversity of the judiciary. Thanks. And I, I wanted to make sure that we talked about that with uh, and that our audience heard from you on that, because again, when people hear about the courts in the federal level, often the discussions are all around partisanship, you know, um, and um, just to get a sense of, of, of how you're thinking about the um, evaluating uh, who's, who's a part of the judicial system. We are minutes away from uh, Q&A from the audience. Um, uh, if we don't have any questions, I'm happy to continue to ask questions, but as a reminder, we'd like to hear from you and please submit your questions to PPIC event questions at gmail.com. Um, Chief Justice, uh, You've um, often said that California is ahead of the nation when it comes to criminal justice reform. Um, and I'd like to get a sense from you about what stands out in terms of where we're, we are ahead and what stands out in terms of where do you think we have more work to do? That's a great question too. What stands out I think in our uh, last 10 years as initiated by Governor Brown, continued by Governor Newsom and the initiative process what we've seen is a review, and in some cases, depending on the circumstances and the standards and the facts, we've seen a, uh, I want to say, a peeling back sort mm -hmm. of, of long-term sentences. Sentences in California, when I was a trial judge, it was not unusual for me to sentence to 103 years of a man who was otherwise 45 years old. Hmm. And that wasn't even a life sentence because, as you know, some sentences carry life or indeterminate life. Mm -hmm. So California has a statutory scheme of not only offenses, but enhancements, including priors that are quite extensive, where you can get to 103 years pretty quickly based on um, several criminal transactions mm. of a serious nature. Mm. So I would say the last decade, you've seen a reexamination of priors. Hmm. Serious priors, the three strikes law. You've seen a reexamination and a change also, these are changes as well, in um, gang behavior, gang, uh, gang enhancements. We've seen a reevaluation of the age of the offender. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we've taken a much different point of view followed by the United States Supreme Court on looking at the human brain and its development in youth mm -hmm. and not holding uh, young offenders as culpable because mm -hmm. we understand that the brain may change, the brain uh, develops, and that they are capable of rehabilitation and mm -hmm. shouldn't be warehoused for years. Mm -hmm. um, so we've seen a look at what we've seen primarily, Mark, is a look at prior history. Mm -hmm. We've seen a look at long sentences. We've seen a look at um, giving judges more discretion to strike sentence or strike offenses by the prosecutor. So we've seen more uh, just a really a, a change in the point of view of uh, in warehousing people. And that mm -hmm. is giving people a chance and opportunity to show themselves changed and then be able to be released and then be able to become contributing members of society. That's probably the arc of where we are. And mm -hmm. the court's as you know, don't take a role on the wisdom of the legislative changes or the governor's the law or the initiatives. We don't, we don't say this is bad, this is terrible, this is good. We study the law and we apply it to the best language and intent that we can determine the voters or the governor and the legislature intended. Thank you. Um, and I would like to pursue this line of questioning, but if I don't get to the audience questions, I'm going to hear from from them, and appropriately so, um, in our post-event uh, uh, survey. So I, I want to take, first of all, a question from Howard Watkins, uh, past president of the Fresno County Bar Association. What legislation would you most like the state of California to enact that would help improve our system of justice? Hi, Howard. I miss you at <laughs> the bar conferences. Uh, Thank you for that question. I think what I would most like to see uh, is not just one thing, I suppose. <laughs> um, but right now, what I would like to see is that the all the restrictions on the judicial branch that are currently in statute that restrict our ability to provide the option of remote access at the criminal and civil levels be eliminated and that you give courts discretion to either require an in-person or require remote and give us, because you probably don't trust us, legislature and executive branch fully and completely, have us report back to you in two years as to what this looks like and who's complaining and why. Give us enough time to address it, to fix the problems and to come back to you with a report that says you should have choice in your access to justice. And the California judiciary will accommodate you. Thank you, Howard. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Jay in the Pacific Palisades. Um, and actually it was a question I was gonna ask you um, later on. So here we go. Um, on criminal justice reform, where do you see um, bail reform uh, heading? Thank you. Well, how much time do we have left? No, <laughs> um, thank you. I think bail reform is a uh, train that has left the station. Mm. We are in the midst of it. Where it goes and what it turns into, I think all good minds want to have input. But let me just say this. I have, for 14 years, I set bail. Mm. And I set bail in Sacramento Superior Court on all manner of charges. And I know how bail works. And I understand the bondsman and I understand the business of it. I understand the insurance of it. But I also have come to know and understand through, uh, through studies, through research and other practices that there may be alternatives to bail mm. that work instead or with cash bail. Do you know that the United States is only one of two countries that uses a for-profit cash bail system in the mm. world? The only other country is the Philippines. Hmm. And so back in a few years ago, I asked the judiciary to study it. I didn't have an outcome. I just said, this is ours. I don't know how it works, but I brought together 11 diverse people. I mean, hmm. a former prosecutor, a former defense attorney, a former cop, uh, some judges from counties who were rumored to be more conservative than others, a new, just, a new judge. I brought these folks together and I put them in a room and I said, the only rules of engagement are be civil. And then after about a year, they came out with a report that said, 
10 recommendations, and they came to the conclusion to eliminate cash bail because of the evils that they found in the studies and the survey. Mm -hmm. And every stakeholder was permitted to appear before this judicial research group. And we found that in setting bail and in make, and ordering bail, it's mostly paid by women, mm -hmm. not the offender. And it's mostly paid in poor communities. And it's paid in places where the 10% of the premium is placed on a credit card and people pay it over time for a long period of time. And it was paid in, in instances where charges were never filed. Mm -hmm. It was paid in instances where people dutifully showed up every day for court. And the purpose of bail is to A, ensure public safety, but B, to, sh to that you show up in court. So we studied it. It became a bill. Governor uh, Brown signed it. And uh, it then lost at the ballot, but it's not over. Bail reform is not over. It's never going to be what it was. It's always going to change. We can argue about algorithms and we can argue about uh, the racism inherent, the bias inherent in algorithms. I don't disagree. That's why I said, let's build the California algorithm. Let's mm. take Stanford and let's take the UCs. Let's build our own and let's beta test it mm -hmm. because no one wants a racist algorithm. Um, and there continue to be discussions about this. And I think that it's changed. Bail reform has, bail has been reformed. It is continuing to be reformed. And I think we all need to be really uh, careful and thoughtful about it together as a three branch solution. Uh, this obviously sounds like an issue that you you've thought about quite a bit and uh, and have very um, yeah uh, see as as a, a very big priority for uh, the state. Is it, does this come from your experience of of, uh, of of being a judge or or where where does this really strong sense of right and wrong uh, come from here? It it really comes from my time as a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. When uh, I saw the, I saw the loss when the breadwinner was in custody, and I saw the families, and then I think it crystallized when I became a trial court judge, and I was making the decision about keeping a person in or out, mm -hmm. and the family was would plead because if the breadwinner is in and can't make bail, then they lose homes and health care and work, and uh, the charges are such that I, I just. Uh, don't know that the charges reflect the conduct. So just show up and sh tell me that you're ob obeying all laws and we'll get you your day in court. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I know it's right. Judges take risk. Yeah. Uh, we make the call. That's what we do. We make the call on the best evidence we have before us. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this question from Tom Scott with the California Community Action Partnership Association. I know you received new funding in this year's budget, but are you still concerned that the courts are not funded enough considering the size of our state uh, and system? And maybe you could elaborate on if, if you think it's not enough, where do we need more resources? That's my part of the question. Yes. Uh, well, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. As of now, uh, courts on average, so some courts are above and some courts are below 82.6% of funding. Mm -hmm. So there's always a deficit, but California costs always drive up court costs, employment, health care, filing fees, buildings, you name it across the board. I deal with that part, the unglamorous part of mm -hmm. justice as a business. Mm. I mean, and it is a business that is related to a right that you are entitled to. And it is a government responsibility and it should be funded as a government responsibility. Mm -hmm. I say to the legislature when I do my state of the judiciary just about every year, I say, for example, governor so-and-so signed 700 new laws Mm -hmm. Where do you think they go? Mm -hmm. And if you don't pay for the enforcement of those laws, how do you think they're being enforced? They're probably not. Mm -hmm. And so I think there has to be a recognition of a fully funded judiciary. And here's the sad part. If I were nefarious, I would say, I'm not going to fully fund the judiciary because I don't want those rights enforced. So how can we, the judiciary, be a check on the other two branches of government if you decide not to fund us or to underfund us? Right. We have no power over the budget except 
persuasion. And believe me, they've seen my face there enough to know that uh, when I come, I'm looking for money. Yeah. Or the judiciary, I'll account for it. I'll tell you how we spent it. And here's the biggest deal. At the end of the fiscal year, if we didn't spend it, we give it back because that's the law in California. It reverts back to the general fund. So we're not carting it off someplace. Um, so yes, we need to be fully funded if you really want a full democracy. That's it, end of story. And we need sort of a multiplier, unless you wanna see me every year with my bill saying, this is what it costs to run the judiciary this year. Maybe you could say, put us regularly to some kind of index that tracks the cost of living and say every year the judiciary gets, I don't know, a CPI index of 5% to cover your cost that increased. Because if for some reason we have money left over uh, that you don't know about, we give it back to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we only have a few minutes left and many questions have come in. Uh, so one from Dan Dunmire. Um, who is the head of the Building Industry Association. You recently asked um, Appellate Justice Lewis Morrow to set up a working group to review the issue of housing in California. Has this task force been able to share their findings with you? And if so, are there any lessons learned by you and the courts from this effort? Housing, obviously, and homelessness, really big issues today. Oh, I completely agree with you. Yes, uh, Justice Louis Morrow and Justice Karen Fujisaki have studied homelessness and a component of the homeless work group has been housing. And I have seen a preliminary report. I expect it to be coming to the full Judicial Council soon to see where it is we can work outside needed legislation and what we need to go to the legislature and lobby for on behalf of a population that otherwise is vulnerable and has little voice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, here's a, a, a big question from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Josh Labresco with OSR, um, who would like to know how the um, California Constitution is different from the US Constitution and how that leads to California's courts to reach different conclusions and SCOTUS about key issues like immigration, abortion, et cetera. Thank you. Well, I'll do my best to answer that uh, in the time I have. Thank you. But there are some issues that are reserved and off limits mm. to state courts. And immigration is one of those issues. That is a federal issue and state courts have little to do with it, except I did set up an immigration resource directory mm. so that you are able, if you're in uh, as an immigrant or uh, interested party to go to it and see the resources that are free and low bono and where they are and who to report if you feel that someone has uh, treated you unfairly. But that aside, all I can do is offer resources because we do not deal directly with immigration in the California courts. Mm -hmm. That's the federal courts. That's the district courts and the circuit courts and the United States Supreme mm -hmm. Court. Now, I think you uh, I talked, you might've mentioned, or I don't know, it popped into my mind. Abortion is an issue that is national, but it's also depends on the state constitution. Mm -hmm. The California constitution and every state's constitution is written differently. Every constitution is written differently. California has a privacy clause that has been interpreted to protect the right of choice. Uh, mm -hmm. That hasn't been litigated in recent time, but historically and rather generally, that's how it's understood that Texas's rule does not affect California's operation. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also say the biggest difference in the constitutions, uh, the reason a California case will head to a federal uh, will be come under the penumbra of the federal constitution is because there's overlap. And then if that's the case, then the federal constitution will control. Now, where a federal constitution and the California constitution are similar, we generally follow each other. We follow the federal interpretation generally, but we reserve to ourselves as a separate state, as a sovereign state, the right to be have broader protections. Mm -hmm greater privacy, greater scope, more rights under the California constitution. And mm. that's true of every constitution in every state, depending on how it's written. That was uh, a fabulous answer. And I, I can't believe how fast the hour went. I, we've reached the end of our program. Uh, Chief Justice, I'd like you to thank you very much for joining us today. I'd th like to thank you very much for all that you've done in this role since um, since you uh, started uh, as Chief Justice 11 years ago, next year will be your 12th. Um, really appreciate your taking the time to join us today, especially with, with all the things that are on your plate every day. So thank you. 
Thank you, Mark. Always a pleasure. And I appreciate the good work that PPIC does. Thank you. I'd also like to once again thank our sponsors and for everybody uh, who's been online today for joining us. Uh, it's been a really informative hour. Um, if you were pre-registered for today's event later today, you'll receive a survey. Please take a moment to fill it out. Thank you. Uh, please be safe and have a good afternoon.